Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Thank you very much. It's really um, it's a distinct pleasure uh, and a privilege to both to have taught uh, for this trimester uh, with wonderful students and, and a great, great place, Naval War College, uh, under the auspices of Toshi and his chair. And it's a great, great privilege to also have the opportunity to, to, to provide a lecture to all, all of you as well. And um, the topic is going to be, um, uh, it's kind of a mishmash of things, but it's really uh, about <coughs> assessing the ever-elusive uh, military balance between the United States and, and China, uh, but uh, put it into the context of competing political objectives, uh, grand strategies of the two nations, uh, as well as some of the um, internal politics and, and weaknesses and challenges both face uh, at, at, at home uh, or, or externally. Uh, so that, um, at least in Washington, D.C., it may be a bit of a corrective from going right into uh, things like the air-sea battle doctrine or, or offshore uh, control and, and these other sort of operational doctrines that seem sometimes a bit divorced from larger questions of strategy and politics and so on and so forth. So hopefully I can provide some uh, of at least my own take on, on <coughs> the context of where these various operational concepts uh, and maybe even military strategies uh, are coming from. So in terms of, I mean, grand strategy is a very popular term and, and maybe overused, uh, but I, <laughs> it's not going to stop me from using it anyway right now. Um, you know, in terms of the United States and the Asia Pacific, um, you know, I, I look back to um, World War II, the end of World War II, and see a fair amount of consistency, I, I think, at the largest kind of level of abstraction, the macro level, which is the U.S. decided uh, that it was going to be the prime player primacy, the prime actor in, in the international politics of the world, but also specific, specifically of the Asia Pacific. Uh, and that was uh, for all kinds of reasons, for, uh, for reasons of, of, of setting, of agenda setting politically, of, of building a kind of liberal world order that the United States thought would be the most consistent with its way of life as the term was used back, uh, back in the 1940s, um, in order to prevent a, a hostile hegemon from emerging once again uh, on the Eurasian uh, landmass, uh, on the eastern parts of it, um, and uh, just to basically shape, shape the environment as it was taking over from, from the UK, uh, whether it liked uh, to or not, is taking over from the last prime player. So the US, um, the U.S. grand strategy has been, has been primacy, and primacy um, has required uh, it, it primacy in the service of the goals, some of the goals that I, that I mentioned. It, the U.S. wants uh, protection as, as far forward as possible, particularly after the war with Imperial Japan, so it doesn't want to have to slog its way back through the Pacific ever again. Uh, the U.S. Um, didn't want another threat to emerge in the first place. Uh, the U.S. Um, wanted unfettered commercial and military access to the region, a very dynamic region. Uh, the U.S. wanted to contain communism back then. That obviously disappeared. But, but in general, the, the idea of, of a favorable balance of power was viewed as all uh, very much within U.S. Uh, US vital interests. Um, you know, th being the prime power has required a set of military capabilities and strategies in order to maintain that primacy. And of course, it's, uh, the U.S. chose also to set up uh, an alliance structure I in the Asia Pacific, uh, also as a means to maintaining its, its uh, position. Uh, and so with that alliance structure has come other military obligations of helping defend and reassure and, and so on. Uh, and of course, the U.S. wants to prevent a major power war and the spread of uh, weapons of mass destruction throughout uh, the Asia Pacific. Now, certainly now, since uh, since a lot of the countries that were once weak or colonized or not autonomous certainly have the capability to 
to develop weapons of mass destruction. So primacy has been, I think, the consistent goal. I think it's been uh, sometimes talked about in, in uh, more explicit terms, sometimes talked about in more implicit terms. Presidents use things like indispensable nation. Uh, presidents use things like only the United States has the capacity to organize uh, the kind of leadership and coalitions. And you know, I think many, some presidents want to shy away from that term, but then they come to see that the United States is still the only uh, player in the world uh, that can uh, affect the kind of, of changes that, that we always seem to want to, to affect. So the, the grand strategy is primacy, and there's military capabilities that I'll talk about next. Uh, that, um, that are required to maintain your primacy. The People's Republic of China, um, and, and I use that as, as um, you know, very specifically you know, today, you know, since they, they won the war, the Chinese Communist Civil War, the Chinese Communist Party uh, in 1949 is, is ruling China and has a, has a distinct set of political goals that would be separate from uh, probably someone else who is a ruling regime or the way the regime is set up in, inside China. So the Chinese Communist Party, I think, has its own set of, of, gra of grand strategic objectives. Um, and, and again, the reason that I use that term is because um, is, is, is almost pedantic in a sense, but it, it is the Chinese Communist Party we're talking about. It's not you know, the kind of democratic system where parties compete even over different uh, foreign policies and grand strategies and, and so on. And, and the specific nature of the Chinese Communist Party uh, from this implicit intrinsic nature um, drives much of its um, objectives and desires and so on. And the main desire uh, is, is an obvious one, is, is, is to stay in power. Now that you know, may be easy to see, you know, it's simple, every party wants to stay in power, but in this case, uh, you know, it, it it's needs to stay in power without, uh, you know, it needs to stay in power. Um, there's no competitive elections, but what is going on is staying in power means that once you have an economically dynamic uh, system, you've kind of had an economic re uh, revolution in China since the reform and opening up period, you haven't had a political revolution, so you have a a one-party state sitting atop a very socially and economically dynamic society. So it's getting harder to stay in power uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. Also, um, so we talk about domestic instability often in China. Now some of that instability is just Chinese people with more wealth, middle classes and so on, just aspiring to more political participation and, and different kinds of of, uh, of aspirations that, that can't necessarily be met under the current system. So the Chinese co from the Chinese Communist Party perspective, uh, that's a threat. You know, that's really something they have to deal with in terms of their national security. Uh, same thing with keeping the motherland together, uh, very important in Chinese thinking, which in the motherland, um, um, both um, definitions of it are, are, are somewhat uh, fluid. Uh, but certainly Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, Taiwan is considered part of the motherland, Hong Kong is considered uh, part of the motherland. Sometimes parts of India are considered part of the motherland. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, yeah, parts of Mongolia are considered part of the motherland, but, but at least you know, Tibet, Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Uh, you know, are considered part of the motherland. The problem there, of course, in terms of Chinese uh, CCP survival and, and grand strategy, and again, the CCP has made uh, um, national rejuvenation and, and the greatness, return to greatness of, of the Chinese party state, the Chinese civilization, the Chinese country, uh, uh, synonymous with um, it's basically arguing that only the CCP can bring China back into this, uh, this, this level of, of national greatness, and only the CCP can hold China together, uh, is the argument that it makes, uh, if not explicitly, then implicitly to its people. The problem, of course, as we see, is you know, the motherland can be somewhat restive. I mean, we see what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, we see that Taiwan is not exactly a willing participant in unifying with the motherland. We see that uh, Xinjiang is not all that happy with the motherland. You know, we see on and off again that Tibet is not all that happy with, with the motherland. So the CCP 
has, um, you know, has uh, its challenges of, of staying in power. But in terms of its external behavior, um, what, what does it mean to, to have as your main goal uh, uh, to stay in power? Well, it also means uh, the continued dynamic economic growth uh, of China. And, and what that means is now that growth requires uh, a lot of maritime transit and, and shipping, a lot of natural resources, increasing dependencies, in fact, on the rest of the world, not decreasing. Uh, as China is, is, is growing uh, uh, stronger and richer, it's actually more dependent on the United States and other countries than it was uh, you know, 20 years ago. So uh, from natural resources to, to agriculture to things that China can't grow because of water mismanagement uh, and environmental degradation to, um, to export markets uh, very dependent upon the international economy um, and therefore um, really needs to think through its maritime uh, future and its maritime interests. I don't have to tell people at the Naval War College uh, what happens when a country uh, is rising to power and has to think about its maritime commercial interests and protecting it. Uh, so that's one element of, 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 of Chinese uh, politi political objectives. Keep the economic growth going. Part of that now means how do you protect your economic interests worldwide? Uh, closer to home, I would argue that China, and this is a uh, still disputable point, uh, I concede, but uh, I would argue that all behavior indicates that China is, is looking to become the hegemon, as it would say, in, in the Asia Pacific. So it has a grand strategy of an aspiring hegemon. And it has a set of military capabilities that are, that are tied to that. Uh, tied to that as well. And I, I would say that in the contemporary period, uh, the, the People's Republic of China, the CCP, has faced three real turning points in the contemporary period. Uh, that is the reform and opening up by Deng Xiaoping <laughs> uh, in the 1980s and, and 79, which kind of started this economic revolution and economic growth and did great things for the Chinese people and for the world, uh, but also created this interest in maritime affairs, uh, that's turning point number one. Turning point number two, I think, was Tiananmen Square in 1989, which uh, kind of demonstrated to the CCP leadership that once you start the economic revolution, uh, the political revolution kind of follows, and, and, and people may want more than just material goods, and the party could split, which almost happened in Tiananmen Square. It could have gone a very different way. So th that's turning point number two. Very. Um, learned a lot of lessons from that. Turning point number three, I would say, is the 1990s, in the beginning of the 21st century, the PRC viewed the world as fairly hostile. You know, this was the democratic age. You know, this was the age uh, <coughs> of um, post-Cold War U.S. unipolar moment. Uh, talks about, you know, the end of history, history ending in, in liberal democracies. Uh, Clinton administration grand strategy being democratization and market uh, market economies. The Bush administration not until you know 9/11 when the focus was on terrorism, but basically the same attitudes as much as they wouldn't care to admit it as President Clinton that the world was moving inexorably into a democratic age and China was the last standing uh, a major Leninist uh, party uh, in the world and the world became a pretty uncomfortable place for China. Uh, you know, for the CCP in, in, in the 1990s. I mean, uh, regimes were being toppled. They had to face the color revolutions in Central Asia. They had to face uh, the fact that the U.S. could do what it wanted in Kosovo, uh, in Iraq, and, and you name it. The U.S. Uh, US could uh, essentially act under uh, humanita for humanitarian reasons, for national security interests, but it just, it just very much, it, the U.S. presidents would talk about things like China being on the wrong side of history. President Obama has said it, President Bush has said it, President Clinton said it, meaning history is moving in a certain direction and you guys in the CCP are on the wrong side of it. So find new jobs, basically, you know, get out of power. Uh, how much time, I'm sorry, I don't have my, okay, okay. Um, so you need, you need certain military capabilities. So, so that's another turning point. The 1990s, I think, and early 2000s, the world became an uncomfortable place to be uh, a powerful Leninist regime. It really did. 2008 was probably the next turning point, and again, too early to tell. 
uh, uh, what that's going to mean. But that, that's where it really seemed like during the financial crisis where this was China's chance to hasten uh, the rise to hegemony a bit more than, than in the past. It just seemed like the U.S. had screwed up royally uh, in the financial crisis, and it did. Uh, and the U.S. was on its heels and dependent on China for uh, financial stability, and, and China just uh, saw, in my view, an opportunity to hasten, uh, hasten its slow and gradual rise to hegemony in the Asia Pacific, um, and started to be um, uh, more assertive about its maritime claims, and, and more assertive about the way it used its military coercively, and so on and so forth. So those, to me, uh, are the major turning points uh, that bring us to today. Um, now let's talk quickly about the, the capabilities. Uh, I don't want to get too much into that because I know where I am and many people here know the capabilities better than I do. But my take, at least, on the capabilities necessary for these two grand strategies. So for the United States, it's command of the commons. I mean, everyone sort of heard that you know, argument before. But to be the prime player in international affairs, you don't just need access to the commons. You need to be able to take command of the commons uh, in order to project your power anywhere, anytime uh, that you want to. That's how the U.S. has operated, particularly since the end of the Cold War, um, in, in any number of conflicts. And there's been quite a few conflicts the U.S. Has, has entered into since that time. But, you know, forward deployed bases, forward deployed fixed wing uh, aircraft and, and, and ships, but no way to actually uh, win a war or, or really show deterrence without commanding the commons so you can bring in uh, as much reinforcement of power, of combat power, as, as is possible. And in Asia, that's been the, that's been the strategy, arguably. <laughs> so it's been, we have a, a couple of big bases and facilities in Japan and Korea, but um, when needed for deterrent or reassurance purposes, quickly reinforced to those places. And, and certainly in thinking about war fighting capabilities, uh, you know, there's no way without the command of the commons for the U.S. to uh, protect its allies and protect itself and its national security interests without uh, being able to get more use out of the commons and denying it to anyone else. Uh, so uh, military, military strategy for, a prim for primacy is, is command of the commons. What about China? Well, two, two kind of main military strategies. Right? One is, um, you know, could be looked at as very defensive in nature from a Chinese perspective, which is if, if you're, if you're um, in Beijing looking out into the Pacific, you see uh, U.S. forces everywhere. You see U.S. forces in, uh, in Japan, you see them in Korea, you see exercises and, and displays of force in the South China Sea. So if you are going to be able to have your way politically over time in the Asia Pacific, you have to be able to, uh, to show uh, the region in peacetime that U.S. forces actually cannot come into those areas where they're used to coming, as well as uh, show that you can use your coercive power. Now, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not passing value on this strategy because every rising power that I've seen has used it in the past. I mean, the United States wasn't exactly thrilled with European powers in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but just because I'm not passing value on it doesn't mean that it's, it, you know, it's still destabilizing from a U.S. perspective. I mean, you know, it's, 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 kind, of, uh, it's kind of getting to the point of uh, these aren't really misunderstandings between the U.S. and China. These are actually conflicting national interests, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the Chinese don't want the U.S. to operate inside the near seas, which, which are the South Yellow uh, and um, South China Sea, the Yellow Sea, and the East China Sea, uh, or to be able to defend Taiwan. And China and the United States wants to be able to do those things. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of a clash that, that you know, has to be managed rather than, um, um, it's not really a misperception, I don't think. I think we're perceiving each other very well uh, in, in this sense. And the China has, has created the, you know, the, the contested zones uh, inside these areas. So it's used um, it's, it's, it's relied heavily on the vaunted missile force, uh, short range and medium range. It's, it's uh, uh, heavily on undersea warfare, uh, diesel submarines and, and, and mining and, and so forth, uh, as well as uh, air power, fourth generation, maybe even fifth generation air power, uh, at, with the primary purpose of being able to follow on 
um, in a course of campaign against Taiwan after a missile salvo, but for other purposes as well. And uh, a whole slew of, of various kinds of ships with anti-ship cruise missiles about which you probably know a lot about. Uh, now, of course, these are, are, are aimed, these capabilities are aimed both at the, the centers of gravity of U.S. power in the Pacific, as well as coercively against, uh, against, uh, against countries with whom China has disputes. Uh, just, you know, good old-fashioned gunboat diplomacy. You know, we have a dispute and we have the power uh, to back it up. So it can, um, it c China can project power in its <laughs> own way into those contested zones, into those near seas. It can't necessarily control them yet, but it can project power more so than most other Asian nations absent US power in, in those areas. Um, so, you know, that's been its strategy of, of rising to regional hegemony. Um, you know, coercive power, being able to use coercive diplomacy if needed, if, if, if other things fail. Uh, being able to raise doubts about um, about U.S. Uh, ability to operate in those areas, uh, and I think successfully to some extent uh, they have been able to do that, uh, and of course to counter U.S. ability to command the commons, and, and that would include using cyber and space and other kinds of capabilities to to um, to, to make sure that the U.S. Uh, you know couldn't use space or or uh, information networks in the ways that the U.S. has become so used to um, uh, using them. Now, n none of this is probably new to all of you. I, just the, the context is, you know, if you're China in the 1980s and 1990s, how do you think about becoming a regional hegemon? Well, these capabilities make, make a lot of sense. Now, mm -hmm. China will face other dilemmas very soon here, which is how do you defend forward? Uh, you know, how do you defend the maritime interests? These are these are coercive uh, regional tools, but how do you defend out to Africa? How do you how do you project power out there? And and again, th I'll get to that as I come into the sort of weaknesses and questions. Uh, but that's that's the military strategy for a regional hegemon. Okay, uh, trends, uh, exercises, that kind of thing. So the U.S. Um, you know, the U.S. Uh, policymakers won't say it in these terms. Um, I always argue that, that uh, they're a lot smarter than I am because uh, we announced a pivot uh, and we're trying to convince China that it's not about China and we're trying to convince all the other allies that it is about China. And I don't have the diplomatic skills to do that. Um, but t so t to me, it, it seems very much like, and of course we have to put it in the lang diplomatic language we put it in, it seems like this is our counter response to the uh, effects of this coercive military buildup that I discussed, given that we are still uh, have a, a grand strategy of primacy and want to be able to operate in those zones <laughs> that are now contested. So, uh, so the, the pivot, the, ta the, the talks uh, from the service chiefs about air-sea battle, uh, the um, agreements uh, with the Philippines, the movement of um, uh, Marines rotationally into, into Darwin, not that that's a, exactly a military capability, that may be more symbolic, but let's say a missile and air defense uh, based in Australia, um, uh, LCSs in Singapore, so on and so forth. Um, you know the the uh, you know the basic idea between behind the Department of Defense thinking, as far as I can tell, and I don't mean to attribute one thinking to a department like the Department of Defense, but the basic idea is that China has created these capabilities in the contested zones. We have to be able to operate in them. So the answer is let's figure out ways of operating. Uh, uh, now that, that, that operate in contested areas of, that use, uh, of the commons that used to not be, cr you know, so it's kind of a symmetrical response. You know, the, the um, how are we going to operate in areas that missiles can fly and hit surface ships? You know, how can we operate in areas where cyber uh, 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 attacks can be uh, used against us so that we can't see where we're going. How are we going to operate in, in an environment of, of anti-satellite weaponry? How are we going to, you know, uh, how are we going to show and reassure now that our carrier strike groups have to be um, pulled back a little bit? You know, so it's a symmetrical response. It's showing that we have an answer to Chinese coercive 
capabilities. Uh, you know, we, we've done things in exercises like, uh, uh, I don't know how we came up with this, ter this term for an exercise, but Operation Chimichanga that I just came across, which was, you know, large penetrating uh, bombers and standoff weapons uh, demonstrated in the Pacific to show that we can, that China, you know, would not have um, a safe haven should they execute these kinds of missile salvos and so on and so forth. So, you know, we're demonstrating, you know, our answer is, well, we're demonstrating that, okay, you've developed all these A2, AD D capabilities, but we can still operate in these zones. You know, maybe may at more risk and maybe the operation, you know, but that's our answer. You know, reassure allies, deter China, um, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the critics uh, of this, and I guess I'm one of them, is to a certain extent is, um, well, you know, you're talking, this is a symmetrical response, I've got to think about that, but also, um, you know, escalation. I mean, you know, we're talking about a nuclear power here, and, and, and uh, I just, I think my own critique is, it's getting harder to talk about conventional U.S. capabilities against conventional Chinese capabilities without thinking through the nuclear piece and, and where we want to go with that, because, we are talking, you know, this would require a lot of strikes, uh, you know, a lot of strikes on the mainland, even if they're military targets. And we don't fully understand kind of the, the nuclear questions like we did uh, at later stages of, of the Cold War. Other critics, you know, come up with uh, offshore balancing, say, well, why go right into the contested zones? Why not, you know, why not, um, and I'm simplifying, I realize I don't have that much time, so well, why not just stay out and, and, and do a protracted conflict and, and do maritime exclusion zones and, and, um, and hit at the center of gravity, which is the Chinese economy and its dependencies, as I said beforehand, uh, on maritime trade and, and do distant blockades. Now, you know, you know, I'm glad we're having this debate. I think it's, it's healthy. It's, I think it's actually to avoid conflict the more you think through it. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that an offshore uh, control strategy is, l is any less escalatory than uh, air-sea balance doctrine. I mean, just because, uh, air-sea battle doctrine, just because, um, you know, cutting off Chinese trade might, you know, get a few people in China angry as well. Um, so, um, it, we should have these debates, you know, the, the presidents should have as many military strategies uh, as possible open to them, both for peace time and war time, but, um, but first of all, uh, you know, we got to think through, okay, if the grand strategy is primacy and, and, and China actually goes to war with us, I don't, I don't believe we'd start a war, but China goes to war over something that we uh, define as a vital national interest to us, you know, uh, it probably would be a big deal with, with uh, all kinds of questions about nuclear um, thresholds as well as what would be our desired end states. I mean, this, you know, it doesn't seem to me that we would just kind of want to slap, slap, you know, back and forth. It, it seems like we may want to punish and retaliate and, and degrade and, and all these other things. And, uh, you know, so some of these doctrines put out there are a good start, but uh, as I said before, for, you got to always think back to what your political objectives are. You know, uh, if you want to retain your primacy, then then you have different political objectives than if you're going to give up give up that fight and give up the candle. China um, China's obviously been demonstrating its force. You know, so just this past year, um, let's just take one. You know, the Maneuver Five exercise in 2013 last year, and and that was. Uh, you know, China coming through with all its fleets, uh, it's it getting together its fleets to, to pass through what it calls and what we call the first island chain through uh, uh, Luzon Straits and, and through important commercial transit points in Japan uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, came around Japan and, and kind of announced to great fanfare inside the PLA and inside China that they've dismembered the first island chain, they've broken out. You know, whether they did so or not, and I'm sure in a piece of exercise they did, the point is that, that this is something very much on the Chinese mind. You know, how, how can we break this chain and how can we get out? And, and it's not just on their mind anymore. They're exercising, uh, you know, joint capabilities and, and, and uh, with, with uh, getting the fleets together, concentrating the fleets and, and, and coming through down into the South China Sea. And those exercises, you know, for the United States, they may seem, 
not as important as they do to the rest of the region that's saying, Japan in particular, or for the Philippines, it's saying, okay, China just uh, transited these straits, came across, came into the Pacific, you know, this is, this is getting a little scary. You know, what, what are we, what are we going to do? This is, this is a change. You know, this is a change to the status quo. So, you know, that matters, that matters certainly to our allies in terms of reassurance. So, passage through those, those straits, you know, experimenting with uh, longer, longer distance uh, projections of power or defense, uh, you know, passage into the Malacca Straits uh, by nuclear submarines, um, you know, these, these kinds of, ex it, it, these kinds of exercises, including uh, exercises, continual exercises with Russia that have more to do with uh, reminding um, themselves and us that they're also a continental power with some continental uh, interests uh, as well. Okay, challenges uh, and uh, uh, challenges and weaknesses to the grand strategies and, and so on. Well, as we were um, thinking through a response to what we viewed as more assertive Chinese power and what we viewed as uh, some uh, much more capable Chinese military, uh, we announced the pivot, we announced uh, 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 make these announcements in 2012 about the new defense guidance. We make these announcements about about what's going to go into Asia and so on. And we decided to cut our budget, defense budget, at the same exact time. Uh, you know, first uh, first uh, Bob Gates uh, did so to get efficiencies. Then President Obama added to that in 2011, and then came the sequester, which was a bipartisan uh, you know bipartisan decision to. To uh, you know, to to really take take the budget into pieces. So about 1.5 trillion dollars now projected cuts in, in in the next 10 years, and you know it's it, it's not as if uh, people are being secretive about how this is affecting our presence in Asia, uh, even the peacetime presence. So I would put that in the category of a weakness of the United States, and and I wouldn't put it in a category necessarily of a fiscal weakness. I would put it into the category of a political. Uh, weakness, because uh, what's coming out more and more is just as sort of the headline-grabbing news is is that China's GDP is surpassing the United States. People who actually look at the the, the variance in wealth uh, between China and the United States are seeing the United States is actually getting wealthier than China. So by measures of of uh, private net, and you can. You know, you can talk to all kinds of economists who have long debates. GDP measuring, of course, the production, uh, you know, per year. So you can, in China, you can build a whole bunch of buildings and turn them down and get GDP credit for both activities versus the actual holding of private wealth. Uh, you know, you subtract that a little bit by how much public debt you have and all the rest of it. And that... Um, uh, is estimated uh, that the gap is growing. The U.S. has about forty-six trillion dollars more, forty-six trillion dollars more than China, and growing. Uh, so it's not a question of of now. It's it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to have politicians actually believe that and and so on. Uh, and yes, we have big fiscal problems and we have a debt and 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 all the rest of it. But. You know, it's it, to me, and I'm not going to get into sort of fiscal debates and all the rest of it. But the reason I say it's not necessarily economics; uh, it's po it's politics, and it's a really a question, a bipartisan question in Washington, of whether we will still uh, play the role of the prime power in international affairs. Uh, and if not, then we have to, uh, I think, not make these commitments to Asia and then not resource them. But you know. And obviously, I'm for making the commitments to Asia and resourcing them, but we can't have this kind of gap that's forming between the commitments and the resources. And that's a, that's a political weakness right now. That's, that's, a, that's a national discussion about how we want to go forward as, as, as a country. Uh, so, you know, that to me is, is the biggest question, the biggest weakness that the United States has right now. Um, in terms of meeting its stated or unstated grand strategy objectives. Now, I'd still rather be in Washington than in Beijing because China, um, uh, you know, let, let's just cut to the chase. The number one um, weakness is just political legitimacy, and, and it's increasingly the case. So, um, you know, the, the uh, 
to the extent that economic growth slows in China over the next few years, uh, to the extent that the aspirational classes either protest more or leave China or take their money out of China, uh, to the extent that the uh, areas that China's governing, you know, are becoming more restive, more and more resources have to be poured into domestic uh, internal problems, uh, you know, than, than China would like, I think. Uh, and, and, you know, <coughs> as, a, as a matter of national strategy, whether the United States, uh, what the United States decides to do with that, whether it's uh, somehow um, take, advantage of, uh, take advantage of that in a peacetime competition uh, and kind of demonstrate to China that, you know, competing or getting into a conflict with the United States is not worth it, or whether the United States just wants to kind of let that play out and make sure China doesn't externalize its internal problems you know, is, is, is another decision, but political legitimacy is the biggest weakness. Now, there are all kinds of operational weaknesses as well, obviously, which are, you know, bad geography, you know, the fact that China is uh, surrounded in a maritime way by uh, countries, uh, mostly democratic countries that are allied with the United States. Uh, China is also, <laughs> it's rising at the same time uh, as, um, as a lot of other countries in Asia are rising. So it's not, it's not like Europe, you know, it's, you know, you have countries like Indonesia and Vietnam and, and the Philippines and, and India that are rising powers, you know, that, that are, are, um, are, are finally kind of seeing the economic growth and, you know, late, late bloomers compared to Northeast Asia, but they're rising. Uh, you know, the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, and, you know, so China kind of <coughs> suffers from that political arrangement uh, as well as, um, the fact that it's a hybrid continental uh, maritime power uh, with more interests on the continent now, given uh, its dependencies on oil and gas from the Middle East, increasingly so, while the U.S. becomes less so, as well as uh, uh, you know, as well as concerns about radicalization, uh, <laughs> foreign fighters from ISIS coming back into Xinjiang, and and all the rest of it. Now. To some extent, laying out these weaknesses is a bit of an abstraction because so much of it is about perception and so much of it is about what politicians actually do with the resources that they perceive they have. So one of the greatest dangers right now is, despite what I just said about weaknesses and strengths, is that China is overestimating its own power and underestimating uh, the United States and the U.S. is doing exactly the same thing. And I kind of think that is what's going on. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have, you know, a guy like me come here and say, well, you know, they're all wrong. You know, the, the, the wealth gap is growing. The, the strategic environment is favorable to us. But if we don't actually do anything with that, it doesn't really matter. The perception, you know, becomes reality. Uh, so, um, you know, I, 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 I suppose that the best you can do with that is, is, is you know, to continue to, uh, you know, demonstrate and show um, uh, you know, our own political leaders that, that while this is a tricky, tricky proposition, uh, if we put uh, some national effort into it, if one doesn't have to turn into a conflict and two, uh, it, we could compete on terms that are favorable to us. And I'll open it up to questions and of, of any kind. Questions or comments? It seems that the United States uh, policy or strategy, whatever we want to call it, uh, with the shift to, to Asia, the pivot to Asia, has changed um, from one that seems to be focusing on, on meeting national interests to now to uh, meeting more economic interests, and that economics is dictating policy. And it seems that uh, we're now moving towards more of appeasement than containment. And uh, do you see that maybe we can be going down a slippery slope, kind of like what was prior uh, to World War II with, with appeasing Germany and, and the, uh, the territorial disputes in the South of the China Sea, and you know, like what we saw with Czechoslovakia? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I think, you know, I'll give you the way things are like the 1930s and 20s and the way things are not like the 1920s and 30s. The way things are like the 1920s and 30s is, um, is political elite, you know, bipartisan political elite kind of, um, you know, wariness of, of international affairs uh, in general. Um, and, and, you know, and, and obviously the, the public um, has better things to do than follow, you know, these things to, to 
to to the every last detail. So is you know waits for leadership to explain to them why the U.S. still needs to be uh, playing this kind of role, particularly with a competitive uh, issue in China and elsewhere in the world. So it, you know the, the number one uh, I think way we are seeing ourselves a little bit like the 1920s and 30s is at least when I'm back in Washington is is the the large amount of kind of uh, navel gazing about where you know where we want to go as a country and can we afford it and 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 uh, uh, sometimes bipartisan neo isolationism and 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 just why are we doing these things and and that kind of thing um, the way it's not like so you know political you know political elites you know lacking you know sort of the energy to to keep this keep this game going um, the way I don't see it like the 1920s and 1930s is we're in a far more favorable strategic position. So even if um, the U.S. is in a retrenching mood uh, or an appeasing mood, you know, we still in the Asia Pacific have uh, these allies and forward postures and, and, you know, no matter what, everyone is still, is still looking to us. I mean, you know, so um, f for China to really supplant us uh, they'd have to. They'd have to actually uh, show leadership. You know, this is the kind. Of, we don't like the kind of world that the United States created. We have our own way. But then they'd have to take care of things like providing public goods and, you know, for everyone and 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 providing regional security and and you know dealing with you know things like ISIS in, in Iraq, which affects them just as much as it affects us. Um, but they're not doing that. So. It's still, you know, it's not, so the pivot in many sense, in many senses was, you know, China created for us a favorable atmosphere. It was that the allies were pressing on us to do more for reassurance purposes in the Asia Pacific. And, and, and um, you know, so, so, you know, so it's not really making gains in that sense politically. Now, your question of, okay, but what are we actually doing in terms of policy concrete policy issues and I think that's a very legitimate question I think a lot of people are raising that you know show me the money show me where's the beef you know whatever you know metaphor you want to use you know what is the pivot is it this is it that you know is it you know the famous uh, um, you know Supreme Court justice <coughs> talking about pornography saying you know you'll know it when you see it that kind of thing you know so now to some extent it, it with a couple years left in this administration at least it is the trans-pacific partnership this massive multi uh, national trade agreement i mean that's what administration uh, officials point to as uh, and, and again only the united states can organize uh, these groups of countries into that kind of economic liberalization grouping um, uh, and in that sense, yeah, it, it, it's very economic, and and, bec and that's also because of the defense uh, budget cuts that I just mentioned. Uh, it's harder to do some of the even peacetime missions uh, out in the Pacific that we were once, uh, you know, really really able to do. Um, so, uh, but I don't know if I would call it appeasement. I would say that, um, you know, I would say that there's m probably more we could do. I, you know, if if I were king for a day, you know, in terms of demonstrating. Uh, both to Asia and to China that uh, our interests there endure and we're going to defend them and we take them seriously and we protect them. Um, but I, I, don't think I'd, I don't think I'd call it appeasement. I, I, I think what I would call it is an administration that is, like all administrations at the end of their term, that has got a full plate and not looking, not spoiling for a fight with another country right now. Um, uh, but, you know, it's not it's not giving in too much to Chinese demands. It's more um, not reversing things that China has done, which is admittedly very difficult to do. I hope that answers your question. That was kind of long-winded, but yeah. So you made a comment uh, earlier saying that uh, it was a debatable point that China was looking as a goal to have uh, themselves as a regional measurement. Well, I just, I'm looking at some of my colleagues who I know might disagree with me, so. <laughs> It's a debatable point in my in my circles, but anyway, go on. I'm joking. I'm, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot. It, it, when I look at the statements from political officials, yeah. military officials, diplomats, yeah, it seems pretty clear. Yeah, yeah, I, it seems clear to me. Um, um, I you know I think. I, I think the counter argument would be, and again, I, I don't mean to put anyone on the spot. I did, but the counter argument would be, um, 
that, um, well, you know, China, what do you think they're going to do? They have to react. This is defensive. Their, their, their economic, uh, 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 I'm a trained lawyer, so I can make the opposing argument as well. You know, that, that the um, cities and coasts, you know, are, are where the maritime activity is. Of course, the Chinese will push back U.S. attempts uh, to to encroach upon it, you know, wouldn't you? Didn't you as a as a as a power? So it's not so much. It's it, it the counter argument is more. You know, isn't it Vietnam and all these other countries that have been more provocative in starting these disputes? And why are they starting these disputes and getting us? And so that's the that's sort of the counter argument, which is let's look at the whole picture. And it's not as as simple as as this grand strategy of of having coercive power. Now, what I would say to that is is um, as well. You know. These Chinese uh, attempts and military modernization program have been going on since the 1980s, you know, well before um, what they see as provocations by, um, you know, by by the, the Southeast Asians or or others. And and part of that is yes, absolutely, an understandable desire. I mean, this is what some people call the tragedy of inter national politics, an understandable desire to do exactly what the United States did, or not exactly, but you know, to, to, it has more power, it has more ambition, it has more interest, it's going to protect them. But that's where we get into, is this about China, U.S. misperception and mistrust, or is this about conflicting national interests now? And if, if I'm right, and it's about conflicting national interests, even if we perfectly understand why China's doing what it's doing, um, you know, how do you manage that to make sure that doesn't become a conflict? You know, and, and you know, so, so I think that's where the debate now lies a little bit, which is, um, is it just, is it, and, and I think this still does go on in the military as well, you know, let's just take the mill to mill relationship with China. You know, there still are the same arguments that I used to hear when I was at DOD, which are, it, we need more and more mill to mill to shape them, to, to help them understand, to make sure there's not misunderstanding. You know, th I think that argument is still out there. You know, my argument is I, they understand very well. You know, um, um, you know, to the extent we want a military to military relationship, it's to manage crisis and manage conflict. You know, so I, I think that's sort of where the fault lines are, are being drawn. Sorry, Lyle, I, I, I did not mean to misrepresent your position. That's it. On the issue of hegemony, I mean, I, I think really the, the interesting part of the debate is what constitutes hegemony, right? I mean, sure, great powers like to have influence, you know, who doesn't? Um, so, and I think, you know, an instructive example there, I think, is a situation that developed in Myanmar, where that was, you know, a lot of us were, would almost call that a client state at a certain point, you know, in the early 2000s of China. Um, where China, you know, was kind of overstepping in all bounds, and it got really burned. I mean, which, by the way, I think raised the question of whether this quote hegemony project is somewhat kind of self-equilibrating. That is, guess what? Locals get pissed off when when big powers kind of throw their weight around too much. But you know, I would also take your point that you've made, which I think is quite right, is that China is rising in a thicket of great power. So whether they will seek to be a regional hegemon or not, and whatever that means, it is a really hard project, right? When you got Vietnam and Japan right there and then Australia further afield than India. So uh, that's, you know, in some ways I think it's just, it's beyond their reach and, and I think they actually do understand that. Um, one other comment, I, I don't really agree though with your economic analysis. Uh, to me, measuring kind of wealth, whatever that means, is a very, you know, <laughs> I guess you don't live in New York, neither do I, but apparently, you know, all of those uh, fancy cars and all the rest of it and those overvalued, you know, real estate and all that, that counts for wealth, you know, extraordinary wealth. But, you know, of course, it has no strategic value, really. It's hard to convert into military power. And, you know, for the, you know, a better metric, let's look at shipyards. You know, you tell me how many, let's compare how many large size, sophisticated shipyards the United States has and how many China has. And, you know, um, from my understanding, we've looked at this some, um, yeah. Some of the Chinese shipyards, not only do they have, you know, several orders of magnitude more, but they're also in some ways more sophisticated, more capable. So that, you know, that is difficult. Okay, here's a question. Um, Taiwan, you 
just finished teaching a course, so I'm sure you're, you've been thinking much about this. And you know, what is your prognosis for the election in 2016? Uh, you know, is this kind of mining Joe's strategy? Is it kind of some sort of weird aberration? Mm -hmm. um, and as some have called for trying to locate Taiwan inside the air sea battle strategy mm -hmm. somehow. Do you, do you mm -hmm. agree with that? Should we be pressing hard on that? Yeah, let me let me take your comments first because they're all, you know they're very you know important ones. You know, I, I think I think China itself has to work out what it means by uh, let's let's take a non-loaded term. Uh, let's let's say it's unhappy with uh, a U.S. dominated you know world order that is you know uh, uh, or unhappy with pieces of it that is very liberal you know, small l and so on, then it, it, it does have to define what the alternative would be and probably rally itself and others around it. So that, you know, that's, that's and, I, and I agree with you that they have not, have not done that, you know, and, and, and right now it's kind of build up capabilities and be able to have these coercive capabilities to back up your claims. It's pushed back the United States and all the rest of it, uh, which may be de a de facto hegemony. On the wealth question, my point is this, and this is, you know, you know, th this is like an esoteric, ec arcane uh, debate among <laughs> economists, which I unfortunately have waded into uh, for, for all kinds of purposes. So in terms of st strategy and war fighting, what you produce on a yearly basis matters much less than the excess and surplus wealth that you own uh, inside the United States. The shipyard example would, 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 I think, reinforce my point about political priorities and will versus wealth. So if the United States did, woke up one day and decided, oh my goodness, China is a big problem and we need you know, uh, to rebuild our shipyards and so on and so forth, uh, it has far more wealth in store uh, than China does and, and could probably spend China into, you know, and, and then given the fact that China is building shipyards but ignoring things, you know, I'll just take one example. We think we have pension problems here in the United States. If China even, you know, lifted up the cover a little bit to look at their unfunded liabilities, the wealth issue would would, would be much more clarified, I think. So it's it to me that's a question of where our political their political will and political priorities uh, happen to happen to do with national power. You know, ours we're kind of sitting on inertia because we don't we haven't faced a strategic competitor in a while. On your question about Taiwan, um, you know, I, uh, Taiwan is a, you know, to me, you know, um, th there are a lot of kind of intellectual fads that go through Washington, you know, f in the first part of the 21st century, it was all about India, um, you know, and in the last few years, it's been all about Burma, Myanmar. You know, in the end of the day, it's always it's always been you, Japan. You know, I mean, you know, Japan may be boring and 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 so on, but the key strategic uh, ally is Japan, and Taiwan fits in very much into into that. So, um, Taiwan and Korea are the perennials in terms of great power conflicts. We may not we may pay attention to other things, but in terms of major areas of great power conflict, it's Taiwan and, and Korea. Uh, Partly because of the Japan alliance, partly because of, of uh, the way the rest of the countries view, uh, even if we didn't mean it to be this way, our commitment to Taiwan, partly because it's a democracy, partly because it does sit on island chains that matter to the Philippines and to Japan, uh, partly, you know, partly, partly, partly. We're just viewed as, you know, its patron. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, it's still the major power flashpoint. Mayang Zhou, uh, I'll just answer that question with this. So here you have a much more conciliatory president, right? So who really reached out to China and, 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 and got somewhere on the economic issues. But here's where the Taiwan polity is, uh, specifically after Hong Kong. Mayang Zhou makes an announcement on, on Taiwan National Day uh, in a re in a repost in a response to Xi Jinping's saying that one country two systems is the system for for Taiwan as well as Hong Kong and says uh, I don't think so I think that you, we could talk about unification the day that China turns into a constitutional democracy my point being that that's where the Taiwan polity is with respect to issues on on China 
uh, here's a guy from the KMT who's had to give up unification. You know, here's a guy who can't get anything else passed even on economic issues. Point being is that the Taiwan polity has moved in this direction. And even if, you're, if, you're, if you want to win as a KMT leader, you have to move with them. So I, you know, I think that's good for democracy. But in terms of uh, China's views about Taiwan and, and conflict stability, it's probably bad for conflict stability. Yeah. The best part of you want to rebalance. It wasn't telling state and treasury you're going to rebalance also. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, it's 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 sort of like become too easy in some ways to criticize. Um, you know, it got it got kind of all mushed up together because uh, uh, President Obama and Secretary Clinton made their their speeches and statements in in 2011 about what it should look like should have came from the Secretary of State and, and, and the President. But then, President, but then the next move was to show up at the Pentagon in January 2012, the President next to you know, uh, Secretary Panetta, and uh, announced new defense guidelines, you know, essentially saying, you know, we're done with Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's time to move forces to, uh, to the Asia Pacific. And then at the same time, some of the air-sea battle doctrine um, uh, issues start to leak out and and get talked about more. So there's no uh, surprise that all of a sudden the pivot and the rebalance become synonymous with uh, U.S. Uh, military posture in the Pacific. I don't think that was the intent, but so often, as is so often the case in in just the bureaucratics of managing Washington, that's what happened. Uh, and there hasn't been a national security strategy to explain exactly. I mean, the, the, probably the best and most articulate explanation has been Hillary Clinton's uh, peace and foreign and foreign policy. Um, so you know, and, and that creates all kinds of problems from my point of view. One is, as I mentioned before, that was happening as soon as the Congress decided to cut the budget even further. Uh, two, you know, so all these questions started to arise about, well, you're going to send more of what into the Pacific and and, and do what. Uh, two, it took away from some of the, uh, let's call them more positive dynamics that <laughs> Secretary, Secretary Clinton was trying to set, which was we are doing this and joining these political organizations and shaping this economic organization so that U.S. can be tied to the dynamic political and economic life of the Asia Pacific. Um, it set expectations very high for, for allies in terms of who is going to be part of this great pivot and rebalance and, and how. Um, so I think it, 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 we, we ended up in a lot of confusion at the end of the day. Uh, again, um, you know, I, it wouldn't be a shock to, to the White House to hear this. You know, I, I think, uh, and, and then of course, you know, other countries have a, have a vote in, in in where the U.S. is going to spend its time and attention. Uh, so you know, then Russia, Ukraine, then the Middle East, and then all the rest of it. And I, I don't think. Um, an administration at the end of its term, you know, with all these crises, is really going to sit down and and try to explain to everyone what what the pivot actually actually is. Uh, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of work to do to try to uh, sift through this and 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 make it work if it's going to work. Yes. Talked a little bit about escalation, escalation control, and uh, I thought it was interesting. I mean, I've looked at, it. as you can imagine, RC battle quite a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Sure. That's why I was I was loath to step into it. You know. And so, and I think you're correct in, 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 in part of your assessment is that you, know, you, you take you, you the RC battle as a document so that the, the two service chiefs don't fight in the tank all the way to an operational plan that includes mainland strikes. Okay, if you take that view, it's it's difficult to imagine something leading to anything other than sort of pro forma escalation, right? So, and you mentioned, well, geez, have we thought about the China's nuclear power? Yeah. I'd ask the other question is, has China thought about the yeah. nuclear power? Yeah. Because while mainland strikes are as undesirable as they may be and as, un as, as hunting as they may be, a strike on a U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. flagged vessel, a U.S. <laughs> naval warship, is going to be viewed by the American poly in a way that yeah. the Chinese don't feel really understand. Yeah, that's a critical, critical point. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, I, I wasn't even arguing that uh, 
that we take any options off the table whatsoever. I mean, I think in my own experience, the more options um, you know, from any level of competition or warfare, the better. You know, so um, you know, making the Chinese there's competitive uh, strategy aspects to air sea battle too, which is you know trying to get the Chinese to to come back and defend more. You know, there, there's all kinds of good things about it. Um, and and my biggest criticism is more kind of to this point. Well, what's the national security strategy that the air sea battle is is supposed to further? Right? You know, and and, and that's not exactly what you were saying, but you know, it's kind of. You know, and and maybe we don't want to say it. You know, maybe maybe you know we just we said it too loudly in the t in the tw in, in the Bush administration, and we just don't want to say it anymore. But um, uh, you know, but your point is is essential. I mean, you know, the 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 and this goes to to my concluding remarks about what I think is the biggest risk is the perception in China overestimating capabilities and underestimating Washington's capabilities and the same thing actually in, in Washington and part of that is you know what is important to the United States so you know you know if you hit a carrier if you hit Guam if you if you hit Hawaii you know you know the US has a lot of nuclear weapons still and and you're hitting a, you're hitting a nuclear power and to me that just adds to deterrence now how to send that message uh, is difficult. It's very difficult, except to state, you know, repeatedly that we're talking about U.S. territory, we're talking about thousands of sailors and, 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 and all the rest of it. Uh, but it's also, you know, um, if, if you recall, you know, we're sort of, at least our stated strategy now is, is more towards nuclear disarmament, right, and trying to get China to sign up to that, which further com complicates the issue. So, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, some pretty, you know, forward-leaning conventional strikes, which I'm not, ag I'm not against, it, you know, as we're, as we're talking at least about, uh, you know, uh, disarm nuclear disarmament and, and, uh, and, 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 and even within the Pentagon talking about using more conventional versus nuclear deterrence. So, if I was trying, I'd be very confused, first of all, you know, as, as to what the U.S. is talking about. But, but, and maybe, you know, that's how the U.S. works, and that's how we somehow stumble into victory, you know, no matter what. We just confuse our enemies so much that, that or our, I shouldn't say enemies, our competitors so much. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, no, that's, I mean, you know, look, at this point, it's, to me, it's, let's talk in tough terms they're ready to in China, in candid terms, to avoid these things so we don't learn about them as they're happening. But uh, it's a critical point. Yes? So my question is about the reaction against China's gradual expansion of influence. So with you, China is overestimating their power and downside downplaying the US power. But uh, so with using its expanding military power, China will exercise its power to coerce Asian neighbors for claiming their sovereignty. Yeah. Especially in the South China Sea and the China Sea. So if even if you keep even 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 if US keeps its supremacy, China is going to keep their sovereignty fight and fight, fight, fight. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, in your opinion, what kind of option does US Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Right. So the question is, um, particularly from a Japanese point of view, but I'm sure um, our Filipino friends and, and Vietnamese uh, newfound friends would would uh, would see it the same way, which is, um, well, that's fine that you know that that's that's fine that you say the U.S. has all this wealth and power if it wants to use it, but <laughs> today. You know, China has decided to press us in the East China Sea, and what are you going to do about it? Or today, China's still in the, in the Thomas Shoal, just kind of more or less sitting there. I don't know what they're doing today, but um, you know. So, what about today? And and the, and the Department of Defense announced twice uh, that they had this counter coercive toolkit, and it was in the New York Times and other places. Uh, and then it kind of went away. You know, I, you know, so. You know what are counter coercive toolkits? You know, to me, they would be things like, you know, China is not through force going to change the status quo. So, if Filipinos have to get to 
uh, fisheries, you know, the U.S. can help them get there, you know, uh, you know just show that the status quo is not going to be changed uh, through force. Um, you know, uh, demonstrations of that sort, and that also gets back to this point, which is demonstrating your seriousness about how serious you take your interests. And if you state that your policy is peaceful resolution, you know, what are you going to do to make sure that your policy is peaceful resolution? And that's a today issue uh, and not a long-term issue. But, uh, you know, the other thing is, you know, in some ways, China got Prime Minister Abe elected, in my view, and, and you know, he's showing some real leadership on his own, and, and there's a lot of things that Japan's going to be able to do that, that the Chinese are going to be quite taken aback by in terms of Japan's latent power. Uh, and, you know, at this point, it's sort of, is the U.S. going to catch up, you know, and, or not? Uh, but, um, so, you know, I, 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 think, I think there are things, in a lot of cases with the Southeast Asians, there's just not the capacity to stand up to China. In, in Japan's case, it's, it's a little different. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, we can come there's that from Taiwan. I, uh, we noticed that uh, this year, earlier this year, the Russia and uh, China, they had some uh, cooperation signed in Shanghai. They also conduct some uh, series of military exercises. So I personally believe that Russia is going to play a very important role in the uh, U.S.-RC relationship, no matter in economics or in military. And how you foresee is any possibility they will have further uh, cooperative relations other than military or something else, and how this will affect? Well, it, it, you know, the, it, it, you know, ever since I, I started uh, on, in China policy, the Russia, everyone, th I always ignore Russia, and someone always asks about it. And, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's like a psychological thing with me or what, but I, I would say it just hasn't panned out yet, and, and, and the Russians and the, and the Chinese uh, may have a common aversion to U.S. activities and dominance, and that's manifested mostly in the U.N. Uh, in terms of real cooperation, they just really distrust each other quite a bit. The one area that I would say to keep an eye out is if uh, this, the sanctions on Russia continue, then um, you know, then they really will have to sell gas at much lower prices to, to the Chinese. I think probably the Japanese benefit the most, though, at the end of the day. Right now, it seems like pie in the sky just because of the lack of infrastructure that Russia has put forth in those areas around China. But you know, that, it can turn into an oil and gas relationship more than anything else. Uh, if I could exercise my right to, to ask the last question. Yeah. Uh, and this is to take the conversation back up to the level of grand strategy, which is to provide the context for understanding the military balance. You've talked about uh, China's biggest weakness is political legitimacy. You've also talked about the importance of perceptions uh, versus real sort of tangible hard power. Yeah. And that raises a larger question about grand strategy, which is the ideological component yes. of the grand strategy. Uh, you know, what, you know, what would you say would be sort of America's uh, grand strategy from an ideological perspective? Uh, you know, is there a role for it? And if there is a role for yeah. it, how should the U.S. leadership articulate it in a way that allows the United States to lead as the you know, yeah. primary power in, in Asia? Well, uh, the Clinton administration used to talk about it openly, which was peaceful evolution. Uh, the, the grand strategy for the United States uh, was to uh, help um, China peacefully evolve into you know, more moderate, liberal, uh, uh, democratic regime. and, and um, uh, it kind of disappeared from the lexicon. I think it's still very implicit in our grand strategy. If you ask uh, administration officials of all type, you know, how does this end well, Taiwan or whatever, they say, democratic China, democratic China, democratic China. But, you know, in terms of, and, and, and I think that's probably the case. Now that, but that's a, that can be, you know, but what tools of statecraft do we have to, to, to see that? You know, and you can say to, you know, we learned in Taiwan about Taiwan's, uh, we learned in our Taiwan class about Taiwan's democratic transition, which may uh, prove to be a good model. Uh, and you know, we can say to our CCP friends, "Hey, look, the KMT is back in power. You know, they didn't they didn't disappear altogether. You guys can get your act together, and uh, 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 you guys can get your act together and compete in elections." Uh, you know, Jim Lilly, one of my mentors, who who was an ambassador to China, among other things, used to tell the Chinese, "You know, what's wrong with peaceful evolution? It's peaceful, and everybody wants to evolve." Um, so, you know, I, I think that, 
you know, I think that uh, we have to get that back on the agenda somehow. The question is, <coughs> what are the prudent tools of statecraft that we have available to us uh, to, to, you know, to actually actuate that? Well, thank you very much, Dan. If you could help me thank Dan for his effort. Thank you very much.